Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I'm gonna be talking about all the books that I read in the month of May. It has been a very busy month. I've gotten quite a lot of reading done. It's definitely been hits and misses. Last month and this month both, I've had more low rated books than I typically do, but I've also found some new favorites. So it's definitely a mixed bag. If you're new to my end of month wrap ups, the way that these work is I start by talking about all of my reading stats for the month. I love stats. I'm a stats nerd. I think it's fun. But if you are not interested, you are more than welcome to skip forward to where I start actually reviewing the books. Some of these books I talked about in more detail in my mid-month wrap-up. I will link that up above for you if you want to go and check that out. For books I talked about in that video, I'm just going to be telling you the title and the star rating. If you want to hear more, you can go check out that earlier video. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into my statistics. This was a pretty typical month for me. I read 33 things for a total of 11,102 pages, which is an average of 358 pages per day. Again, this is very average for me. This does include my audiobooks, which make up a pretty significant portion of my reading, but definitely not all of it. This month I had two DNFs or books that I chose not to finish, which we will talk about. 14 of the books that I read were advanced reader copies or books that were sent to me for review. I did not read any graphic novels. Four of the books that I read were indie published one book was translated and one was a reread. Taking a look at my audiobook reading in May, 21 of the things that I read were audiobooks, so it was a pretty heavy audio month. 63% of the books that I read were via audio. I also read five physical books and seven ebooks. In terms of where those audiobooks were coming from, 10 of them are what I label shelf, which means I had a physical copy on my TBR shelf and I got it off my TBR via audio or primarily via audio. Some of these I read physically for part of it but mostly listen to the audiobook. This month 10 of those audiobooks were from Audible, one was from Chirp, three were from my library, one was an audio influencer copy from Libro.fm. Every month they do provide me with a few titles I can download in exchange for talking about their program and if you're interested in checking them out there is a link down below where I think you can get a free audiobook if you sign up. I really like Libro.fm and if you're an audiobook listener they're worth checking out because their proceeds go to support your local indie bookstore and you can select the bookstore that you want it to go to. So thank you to Libro.fm for providing that. Three of the audiobooks were audio review copies from NetGalley, two were from Scribd, and one was an audio review copy from the Penguin Random House Volumes app. In terms of age categories, you know, this is not going to be anything surprising from the rest of the year. I was reading predominantly books for an adult audience. 27 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience. Five of them were targeted at a YA audience. One was targeted at a middle grade audience, and this month I did not read any books for children. In terms of publication date, in May the earliest published work I read was from 1910. I read a total of 11 books that were backlist titles published prior to 2021. I read six 2021 releases and 16 2022 releases. In terms of author demographics, things are looking pretty good this month. In general, I'm aiming to read about 50% from Black, Indigenous, or Person of Color authors because that is something that I value and try to highlight in my reading and I track it to see how I'm doing. In May 48.5% of the books that I read were by Black, Indigenous, or Person of Color authors primarily from Black and East Asian authors. So that's pretty good. We're close to 50%, not quite there, but pretty close. And, you know, continuing with this trajectory for 2022, this seems to be the year of reading a lot of queer books. In May, 42.4% of the books that I read <laughs> or by LGBTQIA plus authors, people who are publicly out, which is a lot. I mean, I feel like 30 or 40% of my reading this year is going to end up being queer books. I'm not upset about it, but it's definitely higher than my benchmark, which is aiming for 25% each month. Next up, let's take a look at genre. This shouldn't be any big surprise. My two top read genres were romance and fantasy. This month, my top read genre was romance at 10 books in terms of subgenres. That was three historical romances, five contemporary romances and two speculative romances. Speculative is going to be your paranormal sci-fi fantasy romance. I also read seven fantasy novels, five horror, five sci-fi, two memoirs, two general nonfiction titles, 
one literary fiction title and one mystery title. So a lot of my favorite genres, but a little bit of a mix of other things as well. Next up, let's take a look at star ratings. And as I said, you know, last month and this month, my average star rating is definitely down from what it usually is. It's usually more like a 3.9 to 4 star. And this month, my average was 3.7 stars. And I think that is because I'm having more lower rated books than usual. In May, I gave one book one star. I gave two books one and a half stars. Three books got two stars. Two books got two and a half stars. Three books got three stars. One book got three and a half stars. Ten books got four stars. That is typically my most given rating and that was definitely the case this month. Four books got four and a half stars four books got five stars, and three books got six stars. And in my personal rating scale, a six star is what I give to a favorite of the year. So I had three new favorites. There were also a couple of five stars that were close that, you know, maybe later in the year, if they stick with me, I might nudge up. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll point out what those are. But overall, the, the good ones were very good but it was definitely brought down by some not so great ones. Lastly, let's take a look at how I'm doing with my 2022 reading challenge. You might notice I decided to create some new graphics so that you can actually see the books on that challenge instead of just the numbers. So let me know your thoughts. Is this interesting? Like getting to actually see the books that I put on this challenge for me? Uh, let me know. So for 2022, I had these eight classics that I wanted to read and I have read five of the eight, doing really well there. And then I had these eight sci-fi fantasy novels I wanted to read, and I've so far read three of them. So for halfway through the year, we're doing pretty well. With that said, let's go ahead and move into all of the books. We're going to start with my DNFs, books I chose not to finish, then my lowest rated books, moving up to my highest rated books. This month I had two DNFs, and one of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That book was Barbarian Alien by Ruby Dixon. So if you want to hear more about this, go check out that video. This is definitely a bummer. It's a book I had pre-ordered, and uh, Sadly, this was not for me. I also ended up DNFing Tripping Arcadia by Kit Maquis, which is kind of a bummer. I had high hopes for this. It definitely sucked me in with like the queer modern gothic novel bits and I was excited to read it. I would say that this is actually much more like The Great Gatsby, but with poison. And yeah, I was honestly kind of bored. I could sort of see where I thought that the book was going to be going at the point I DNF'd it. I think I read like 30 or 40 percent of the book before DNFing it. And so I looked at some reviews to see if I was correct in the direction I thought the book was heading. And I was and I was just like, this is not going to be the book for me. So in general, reviews seem to be mixed on this. Some people really love it. Other people don't. Maybe take a look at some of those reviews and make your own judgments about whether this would be your thing. It is a debut novel. Sadly, this just wasn't working for me and I decided to cut my losses. This month one book got one star and I did talk about it in my mid-month wrap-up and in a reading vlog. That was Zodiac Academy The Awakening by Caroline Peckham and Suzanne Valenti. This was definitely not the book for me. Then I gave two books one and a half stars. Both of them were advanced copies that I had from NetGalley and were not what I was hoping for from them. The first one is Go Hunt Me by Kelly DeVos. I just finished this one recently actually. So I had thought that this was gonna have a gothic vibe and vampires. There is like nary a vampire to be seen in this book. They mention Dracula, like the history of it, but that's not really what happens in this. It is a YA horror novel following a group of teenagers who are interested in filmmaking, who get the opportunity to make a horror film, a short student film, at this creepy castle in Romania where supposedly Vlad Dracul, who inspired Dracula, lived. And bodies start dropping. This does get quite gory. I appreciated the fact that it was really going for the horror piece of it, but I did not end up liking this book very much for several reasons. Number one, there was the pacing. About the first half of the book is just set up, and then the second half is action at breakneck speed. I don't know why we needed the first half for set up, because the characters are really thin because the characters are very thinly characterized. They're annoying, but lack nuance. They feel, I don't know, like they're just, they're just not 
interesting or deep characters at all. They're more irritating to read about. And I don't know why we needed half the book to set up all of these characters who feel like cardboard cutouts anyway. If we had just jumped into the action, I maybe could have forgiven the lack of good characterization and the plot holes and things that were kind of dumb and didn't make sense. But I think because we spent half the book building up, I was like, <laughs> No. There were also some things in terms of plot that I was like, this makes no sense. Like why, why they would do this. And I also felt like the foreshadowing of the twists was so heavy. I kind of guessed early on most of what was going on and it definitely detracted from my reading experience because I think I spent the whole book just being like, okay, this, this is probably what's really going on. I wasn't a hundred percent correct, but I got pretty close and yeah, I just, I didn't, I didn't really like it. I gave this one and a half stars. I rounded up to two on Goodreads, which means it was just okay, but more on the didn't like it side. Some readers do seem to be enjoying this. I think if you can just go with it for what it is, maybe you'll have a better time than I did, but I, I wasn't much of a fan. And then what's interesting is the other one and a half star was also a YA horror novel. This is Primal Animals by Julia Lynn Rubin. This I was excited about because I was like, queer horror novel where a girl goes to a camp where weird stuff happens. Interesting. I'm intrigued. Uh, again, didn't end up really liking it. It's another book where what they tell you happens in the copy, like the the setup for the book, if you if you read the description, all of that doesn't happen until you're like 60% of the way through the book. So it's kind of giving away like most of most of the plot. So it takes forever just to get to that point. And then I didn't find a lot of it believable. And there was a lot of stuff that I felt like was thrown in for shock value and was trying to say something but not successfully. I get into it a little bit more in my Goodreads review and my Goodreads is always linked down below. So if you want to check that out and you want to see some of the more spoilery content warnings, I would recommend doing that. There is some really disturbing stuff in this book. So like if you think you might need content warnings, you might want to take a look. Things involving animal cruelty and murder and I don't know. I, I also just don't know what this book was trying to do. That was part of what was weird to me is I'm like, what what is the message? <laughs> like, like, what's the message of this book that like m murdering boys is bad? I, I don't I don't know. It was weird. It's it's being pitched as feminist and I'm like, I don't I don't think this is actually feminist. I, yeah, it was not for me. So, you know, just heads up if that's something that's on your radar. This month I gave three books two stars and I talked about all of them in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Soul of the Fire by Terry Goodkind, Talking Back to Purity Culture by Rachel Joy Welcher, and uh, one thing that I will note here is I know I said that I was going to do the purity culture video this month. Uh, some things with my family and mental health and everything going on in Texas has pushed back my timeline on that. And I'm now thinking I might do something a little more ambitious for this project. So it may take longer than I had planned. So um, I will be I am still working on it. But yeah, things kind of got in the way. For those of you who are waiting, it's sorry. I know it keeps getting pushed back, but I, yeah. I also gave two stars to The Visit by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and I talked about it in my mid-month wrap-up. This month I gave two books two and a half stars, and I also talked about both of those in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are A River Enchanted by Rebecca Ross and Hyde by Kirsten White. If you want to hear about those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. Then I gave three books three stars, and one of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That book was The Nature of Witches by Rachel Griffin. I also gave three stars to a short story. This is 2043 A Merman I Should Turn to Be by Nisi Shaw. This is part of a collection of short stories that are Audible Amazon originals, and I have the audiobook for free. This was really interesting. I had been interested in reading from Nisi Shaw for a while, a Afro- futurist writer, like sci-fi stuff. And this short story was so interesting. It had a lot of really fascinating ideas, but it was way too short. And it's written in a way that I think is confusing to most people. And even me, like I was like, I kind of see where you're going and see what you're trying to do here. But like, you have to pay really close attention to pick up on all of it. And there's a lot of questions left unanswered, a lot of things that aren't really fleshed out because it's cramming what could easily be a novella into a 30 page short story. So the basic premise of this is that 
It's set in the relatively near future in 2043, and Black, Brown, and Indigenous people have been offered reparations in the form of 10 acres under sea, but in order to claim it, they have to undergo um, physical modifications to make it possible for them to survive underwater for longer without breathing. Really interesting concept. And it follows a couple of people who are part of a performance group who are moving into one of these underwater cities, and they're traveling out there is dangerous because white supremacist groups think that allowing this is dangerous. I don't know, it's like a whole thing. And then some other some other stuff happens. It's a really short story, so I'm not gonna spoil all of it, but it's exploring some really interesting ideas. And I liked the concepts, but I think it was just way too short. And if you take a look at the Goodreads reviews of this, so many people are like, I don't understand. It was really confusing. I don't know what was going on. I, I get what it was trying to do, and I do think it's interesting, but it was just, it was too much to cram into such a short story. This does, however, make me more interested in picking up something from Nisi Shaw because their ideas are pretty great. My final three star read of the month was an e-arc that I had from NetGalley. This is How to Fake a Wedding Date by Karen Booth. Honestly, I picked this up because it said it was a curvy romance and it has this fat woman on the cover and I was like this looks great. I love the fact that it's a Harlequin category. If we're actually going to get some good fat representation that could be awesome. Uh, yeah heads up like the only fat representation you're getting is the cover. Like love the cover but if you're going into this hoping for a fat rep you're not going to get it. There's like one reference to her being curvy and that's it. Like otherwise it just treats like any other romance. So I don't know why they're marketing it this way when that's not actually what you're getting. That aside, I thought it was a perfectly fine, enjoyable category romance. It is a brother's best friend romance. So there's a woman who had left her fiance at the altar and has a really bad reputation and needs a wedding date. And so her brother suggests that his best friend and business partner be her sort of fake wedding date. What he doesn't know is that they had had a one night stand months ago and it's like a whole thing. I didn't like the brother. They supposedly have a close relationship but he's kind of awful about her and I don't know. I didn't like there were some issues I had with it but like it was enjoyable for what it was. So three stars. Didn't actually have the fat rep that I was hoping for. Otherwise it was fine. This month I gave one book three and a half stars. That was Our Crooked Hearts by Melissa Albert. This is an e-arc that I had from NetGalley. This book is coming out in June. So this is kind of a darker YA novel that's kind of a horror fantasy. It has witches, dark magic, parental secrets, a fraught mother-daughter relationship. I feel like you could kind of compare this to something like The Craft as far as a teen story that leans darker. I liked this and I think some people are gonna like it even more than I I did. I didn't love it the way that I was hoping to, but I did enjoy it. It follows two timelines. One is 17 year old Ivy who is experiencing some weird things and suspects that her mom is holding some dark secrets. And then it follows her mom's timeline as a teenager in the 90s who forms a coven and gets into some like pretty dark magic stuff. Note that this book does include blood magic and animal sacrifice, including the mutilation of bunnies. So if that's gonna bother you, like heads up, that's kind of my big content warning for this book. I liked but didn't love this. I wasn't equally invested in both timelines most of the time is, is part of the problem. And sometimes the writing style sort of lost me, but I think a lot of people are gonna enjoy this one. And if you're looking for a darker witchy YA kind of horror novel, I think this is a good one to pick up and definitely better than the other two that I was not a fan of. Next up, let's talk about my four star reads. This month there were 10 of them and five of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are American Royalty by Tracy Livesey, The Vagabond by Colette, The Black Pages by Nettie Okorafor, Wild Seed Witch by Marty Dumas, and Fake It Till You Bake It by Jamie Wesley. If you wanna hear about any of those, go check out my mid-month wrap up. I also gave four stars to A Matter of Temptation by Stacey Reed. If you are a fan of historical romances and you have not yet read Stacey Reed, I highly recommend her. She writes really great steamy historical romances with good characters and social commentary and interesting historical tidbits that she explores in each book, and this was no different. This one was a lot of fun the way that it started. It begins with our heroine who dresses up like her twin brother to go and fight a duel on his behalf because she's the better swordswoman, and the man that she duels with is an earl who ends up being the love interest who figures out her identity and offers her a job 
Kozlov as his secretary. She's been ruined by some drama in her past and they have this kind of will they won't they slow burn relationship that gets very steamy. But also this book is interesting because he's into politics and is kind of a reformer. And so this is talking about things like women's rights and the rights of the working class at the time and some of the reform bills that were being put up. Things like women not having the ability to obtain a divorce very easily in most places. Things like property rights. And so this gets into some of those historical elements while also being a great romance. So four stars. I really liked it and I would recommend. I also gave four stars to Crimes of Passion by Jack Harbin. This is an Audible original romance novella by an author who I've read from before and really love. And I'm so excited for him. We're mutuals on Twitter and I know this is a really big deal. Previously he had only written indie romance and so getting getting this opportunity is really cool. This is a Rivals to Lovers gay romance following two black men who both have true crime podcasts but very different approaches and they don't necessarily like the other person's approach but they end up collaborating in memory of a fan and sparks begin to fly. So it's kind of grumpy sunshine, opposites attract. One of them is like very sort of buttoned up nerdy by the book. The other one is more of a jokester but they both really care about true crime and about talking about marginalized people and black people and the way that crime affects them specifically. So this book is dealing with some heavier issues but mixing in this romance that's pretty sweet. It's not very long. I would definitely recommend you go and check it out. It is part of the Audible Plus catalog so if you're an Audible member you can go and read it for free. Jack very kindly put me in contact with his publicist and they sent me a copy for review so thank you so much. I really liked it a lot and I think this is a great introduction to Jack's work if you're interested in reading from a gay romance author and this would count for some of those bingo spaces in the Queer Romance Readathon in June. So just saying, if you're looking for a good option, this is definitely one. I also gave four stars to I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. This is a memoir about living as a black woman in the United States, and I think it's very good. This is not necessarily breaking new ground, but it's well written, it's thoughtful, it's written by a woman who identifies as a Christian, and so that kind of gets woven into the story a lot. This is the kind of book that I could see handing to somebody who is early on in their anti-racism journey as something that might be really good for them and thought-provoking, but who is still open to things. I really liked it. I gave it four stars. Thank you so much to Kara. This was a, a birthday present from, from Kara, and I read it pretty immediately, so definitely would recommend this is one that I did listen to on audio as well from my library and the author narrates it herself so maybe give it a try. One thing that I want to mention from this book that is what I think really stood out to me that I haven't seen a lot of other people talking about in the same way that I, I, I do think is important is about how white people who are just beginning to realize their own privilege or their own participation in racism or microaggressions will sometimes end up talking about their experiences with family members or things they themselves have done to black people and are re-traumatizing them sort of seeking absolution and recognizing that that is more about you than about them and that you should talk to other white people about that or talk to your therapist about that not talk to other black people because that's just to make you feel better and all it's doing is harming them. So I think that's an important point that is made in this book pretty effectively and uh, something I, I took away from it. I also gave four stars to The Best of All Possible Worlds by Karen Lord. I have a reading vlog that I will link up above if you haven't seen it yet where I read this and two other books. It's a Can We Trust Angela from the Literature Science Alliance vlog and I think I ended up deciding yes we can. I read three books that she loves that I have bought because of her recommendations because of her reviews and uh, this was one of them. It's one of her favorite books. It wasn't what I was expecting but it's really good. It's beautifully written. It is an episodic quieter, more character driven piece of science fiction. It's got interesting sci-fi elements and then a very very slow burn central romance but it's episodic in that there's not a clear driving plot throughout the book. It kind of takes episodes from the lives of our main characters. So I really liked it. I didn't love it the same way that Angela did but I would for sure read more from Karen Lord and I think a lot of people could enjoy this. This is something that I would recommend for people 
who are interested in getting into sci-fi, don't know where to start, but enjoy more literary books or books that are just kind of beautifully written or more character driven, this might be a good place to start. My final four star read was The Verifiers by Jane Peck. I had this from Book of the Month and I really liked this a lot. I want to read more from this author. It's a debut mystery with some tech things mixed in that I thought was really interesting and it's it's a little bit of a slower paced mystery because it's also mixing in personal growth stuff and family drama. Our main character is a Chinese American lesbian woman who is not out to her mother, so her mother still thinks she's going to settle down with some nice Chinese boy, but she has started working for a company that verifies the identity and statements of people on dating apps. So a client can say, hey, I want to know if this person I'm chatting with is who they say they are, like, can you investigate them for me? And so she's working for a secretive firm. But somebody dies and she starts investigating that murder. So it's a amateur murder mystery, but thematically it's exploring some really interesting things in the tech world about privacy and data collection and like dating apps and stuff. I really liked it a lot. I hope we get more in this series. I think we're going to and I, I would for sure read more from this author. It was great. Moving on, let's talk about my four and a half star reads. This month there were four of them and I have not yet talked about any of them. First up we have Best Serve Cole by Joe Abercrombie. I liked this a lot. Apparently not everybody does, but I was a fan of this. There is an entire episode on the podcast that I co-host along with Leanna from Leanna's Library. I will link that episode up above on Chapter 3 Podcast where we talk in depth spoiler section and a non-spoiler section about Best Serve Cold, but I thought this was fascinating. It was very fast paced, so if you felt like the first Law trilogy was slow, this one moves much faster. It is a revenge story, so it's following a woman who is seeking revenge for the murder of her brother and the attempted murder of herself, and it is her gathering together a collection of individuals and enacting revenge. A lot of, there, a lot of people die you know, the characters aren't necessarily good people, but I don't know what else you would expect from Joe Abercrombie, but I really like this a lot. I gave it four and a half stars and I'm excited to keep reading in this universe. I also gave four and a half stars to Ship of Destiny by Robin Hobb. This is the final book in the Live Ship Trader series, and we will be doing a live discussion of this on maybe the night that this goes up. So go and check that out. I will put a link to that live show up above as well. I really like this. I would say this is my least favorite in the trilogy, but it was still four and a half stars. The other two were like favorites. And as a whole, the trilogy is one of my favorite things. I have some questions about how certain things were handled. And I will say this was the hardest to read, starting at around the 75% mark with the sexual assault and gaslighting that happens. It was a lot. Um, it was definitely rough, but I like Robin Hobb is a favorite author for me at this point. I love the way she does character work, her plotting, her world building. It's, it's just really excellent. Um, so yeah, four and a half stars. The final book that I gave four and a half stars to was The Cross and the Lynching Tree by James H. Cohn. This has been a book that I've been meaning to pick up for over a year now, and I finally ended up listening to the audiobook, and it's very good, and it's very good. James Cohn was a Black theologian of liberation theology, and I think this is a really interesting and powerful book that explores the theological and metaphorical links between the cross and, you know, as it says in the title, the lynching tree. And I do think it's very striking, it's very powerful, and he talks a lot about the history of racism and white supremacy in the United States, about the history of violence against marginalized bodies and the way that that is so similar to what happened to Jesus. It's really interesting. So I think if you are looking for a different sort of theological take, camera overheated, we are definitely entering summer. So if you hear the air conditioner on in the background, apologies. The Cross and the Lynching Tree is an excellent book. And if you are looking for something that offers another approach to Christian theology that makes more sense within the context of anti-racism work. I think this is maybe a good place to start, so definitely worth a read. I'm glad that I picked it up finally. Moving on, let's talk about my five-star reads. This month there were four of them, and three of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Summer's Edge by Dana Melly, The Perks of Loving a Wallflower by Erica Ridley, and A Lady for a Duke by Alexis Hall. 
If you want to hear about any of those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave five stars to Nine Fox Gambit by Yoon Ha Lee. This is another one that I read for that reading vlog that I mentioned, reading books that I picked up because of Angela. I loved this. I had been really intimidated by it because people say it's so hard and confusing and difficult to read. And yes, it is complicated, but if you just kind of go with it, it'll eventually make sense. I think you're going to only hurt yourself by trying to wrap your head around all of it from the get go. You just kind of have to go and learn the world. But I ended up loving this. This is one that was like almost a favorite, but I don't know if it's like quite a favorite of the year, but it's definitely up there. Like this is a very high five star for me. I for sure want to read on in the series. It's an interesting blend of military strategy, interesting characters, and political machinations with a fascinating world and like science based on higher math that feels like magic. So yeah, anyway, this is not something I would recommend for a newbie to sci-fi. This would not be where I would recommend you start. But if you, like me, have been intimidated and you're a seasoned sci-fi reader, like you've, you've read a decent amount of sci-fi, give it a try. I don't think it's going to be as bad as you think. I feel like most people who have read a fair amount of science fiction can get into this. Just sort of go with it for a while and realize that you'll eventually figure it out. This is one that I could see rereading and probably getting more from it on a reread. But I, I think to start, you just kind of have to go with the story. Um, yeah, I was definitely a fan. And as we're moving into Pride Month, if you're looking to read a sci-fi novel by a queer author, Yoon Ha Lee is trans and queer, so uh, this could be a good option. Lastly, let's talk about my six star reads. These are the books that were favorites of the year. This month there were three of them, which is very exciting, and two of them I did talk about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Hashtag Church 2, How Purity Culture Upholds Abuse and How to Find Healing by Emily Joy Allison, and A Taste of Golden Iron by Alexandra Rowland. Really love this, and it's coming out in July, I believe. The final book that got six stars for me in May is the third book that I read for that reading vlog, Reading Things Because of Angela. This is The Sword of Kaigen by M.L. Wang. If you want to hear all my detailed thoughts, go check out the reading vlog. It is spoiler free. I don't really talk much about spoilers, but I loved this. It was so good. I had an audiobook and I had to go out and buy myself a physical copy because I was such a fan. This was not what I was expecting. The character work is excellent. The action scenes are actually interesting, which is not always the case for me. And it's got a kick ass mom as our main character, which I love. This is heartbreaking. It does deal with things like loss of a child and miscarriage and abduction of a child. Like, so there's some, you know, rough content. You may make sure you're in the right headspace for it when reading it, but I loved this so much. Easy six stars for me. So there you go. Those are the 33 things that I read in the month of May. Again, while I did have some definite disappointments this month, I also read a lot of amazing books and I'm excited to see where June takes me. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, tell me about a book that you read maybe on audio or from the library or something like that and didn't expect to love but then were like I love this I need to own a copy something like that like if that's an experience you've had that was definitely how I felt about Sword of Kaigen so if you've had something like that let me know in the comments down below if you like this video it does help if you give it a thumbs up subscribe if you want to see more thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time